Hi, seventh graders. It's Mr. Shear. Today's topic is the Alamo. And the Alamo is both a place, it's an actual building, um, a church, and it's a battle. So the Battle of the Alamo, and it's the most famous battle in kind of the Mexican-American slash Texas Revolutionary Wars that happened in the 1830s and 1840s. And it's the only specific event we're going to focus on uh, out of this little unit on the Mexican-American War. Now, if you're wondering, why in the world are we talking about uh, Texas when a Washington State history class? It's because, really, if you notice when Oregon officially gets claimed, Oregon and Washington, when the Oregon Territory officially gets claimed by the United States, 1846, it's right around the same time that we get all this land, including California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, from Mexico. And it's also right around the time that Texas comes into the U.S. So it's really the mid-1840s. The United States goes from this pink area here, plus the purple Louisiana Purchase Territory, to the modern United States that it is today. And this is all part of a larger theme that plays heavily into Washington state history, Manifest Destiny. We're going to talk more about Manifest Destiny throughout the next couple weeks, but the short version is it is both a philosophical religious belief and a political belief that the United States is destined, in part by God, to travel to the West and to claim all of this land that will become part of the eventual United States that we know today. So it's a very important term, manifest destiny. And really, the Alamo doesn't have much to do with Washington state history. However, it is the most famous battle of the Texas Revolution and Mexican-American War, and we are talking briefly about the Mexican-American War and the Texas Revolution, so we're going to focus on one battle, the Alamo, from that series of events. The battle itself is about 13 days from February 23rd, 1836, to March 6, 1836. So it's a 13-day battle. It's a huge American loss, meaning that every single person, about 188 soldiers in the Alamo, fighting uh, against the Mexicans. These are Texas soldiers, and all 188 of them die. So in that sense, it's a huge loss. However, the Americans are greatly outnumbered in the battle. Um, Mexicans are wounded and killed at a rate of about three Mexicans killed or wounded for every American. And so it's seen as a valiant effort made by Texans in the United States. Uh, so it's seen as like a very important battle. And then the big reason that it's so famous is because of this line, remember the Alamo, becomes the battle cry. That line, remember the Alamo, became the battle cry uh, that defined and motivated the country of the United States in its battles against Mexico, which eventually results in the United States taking about half of the country of Mexico. So we're just going to jump in. The Alamo itself is a building in San Antonio, Texas, which is here on the map. It's actually right in the city. It's still there today. It's one of the most popular tourist destinations in the United States, and it's just right in downtown San Antonio. Um, what it was originally was a 18th century mission, a church in San Antonio, Texas. It was originally built to be a church to convert local Native Americans to Christianity. The word Alamo in Spanish means cottonwood, like the trees nearby where it was built. The church was built around May of 1744. It was built from limestone from a nearby quarry. Um, Lots of issues during construction. Some of the towers were never completed. So it's, a, it's an impartial building. And it was used as a church until 1793. So it looked a little bit rustic, to say the least. Now, just a little context. We talked about this yesterday. But during this time, Texas, in, in 1836, when the battle takes place, up until 1836, Texas is part of Mexico, along with most of the western states, California, Utah, Nevada, etc. So Mexico is huge um, back in the 1830s. 
Texas, for various reasons discussed yesterday, wants to get its independence from Mexico and break free from Mexico, and eventually it wants to join the United States. Mexico didn't want to let its land go. The Mexican leader was General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. He leads the Mexican army in fighting the Texans from gaining independence. So he's the leader of the Mexican army at the Alamo. He is both president and general, lead general of Mexico. Fun fact, during this time, uh, Texans were called Texians. Now they're just called Texans. So the Battle of the Alamo is Texas having its own revolution against Mexico versus the Army of Mexico led by General Santa Ana. I'm taking a couple of the famous people associated with the Alamo. First is William Travis. Travis is the colonel in charge of the Alamo. And some info about Travis is he's a young colonel. Um, he's only in charge because the guy who was previously in charge of the battalion there um, left to deal with his ill family. And William Travis is not super battle tested. He's seen as a young, inexperienced leader. He does a great job, uh, but coming into this, he's seen as young and inexperienced. One of his more famous legendary acts was as the Mexican army is surrounding the Alamo, uh, William Travis is said to have drawn a line on the floor with his sword at the Alamo in March of 1836. All who want to stay and fight at, at the Alamo would have to cross the line. Colonel James Bowie was too sick to cross, but was pulled across in a cot, and everybody crossed the line except for one person who supposedly escaped and told the story of the Alamo. So James Bowie, this is the other person in charge. So Travis and Bowie split leadership of the defense of the Alamo. Now, whereas Travis was inexperienced um, and very, very, I don't know how best to say, book smart, Bowie, on the other hand, is an outdoorsman. Uh, he has the support of the men. He's a rough and tumble guy. Um, and him and Travis initially butt heads for leadership. They both want to be in charge. Travis is officially appointed to be in charge by the president, but Bowie has the support of his men. And Bowie is most famous today for inventing the Bowie knife, which is a very common hunting knife. Um, he was also sick. He ends up getting sick on the second day of the fighting, uh, and he, he does die during the Battle of the Alamo. They all do, but he dies valiantly, supposedly in bed, as the story goes. As the Mexicans are breaking into the, the infirmary ward where he's laying in bed, he shoots two or three soldiers uh, before dying himself. And the third important person from the Alamo is Davy Crockett. And Davy Crockett is the most famous American at the Alamo. He was a storyteller, an expert marksman an amazing hunter, a former soldier. Most recently, he'd been a politician, and he was Tennessee's representative to Congress in the House of Representatives. He is a celebrity by the time he's at the Alamo. He is a known celebrity throughout the West, throughout the United States. There are plays about Davy Crockett's life, but he's a living legend during his lifetime. He is also famous for wearing a raccoon skin hat, or as it was often called, the coonskin hat. He dies in the Battle of the Alamo. He died um, after the battle. He's one of the few soldiers on the Texan side uh, to survive the battle, and he is more than likely executed after the battle is over. So there's your big three. William Travis, James Bowie, Davy Crockett. I'm going to jump into a video that gives a little bit more of the backdrop. It's about two minutes. and gives a little bit more of the backdrop of... What are the events leading into the Alamo? With each passing day, Mexican President Santa Ana grew increasingly furious with the Texas Revolution. He felt that illegal immigrants had crossed into his country, flaunted its culture, values, and laws, and were now literally trying to steal a piece of it. So he wasn't happy. Santa Ana demanded the rebels surrender or suffer the consequences. The Texans refused and were officially declared traitors to Mexico. As such, the Mexican president swore that there would be no prisoners taken. 
He sent a letter to this effect directly to U.S. President Andrew Jackson. But the letter wasn't widely distributed, and for whatever reason, Jackson failed to notify the American recruits that Mexico wouldn't be sparing their lives. The commanders of the Alamo were under no illusions when it came to evaluating their preparedness for battle. They knew they lacked both provisions and manpower, and they knew it would be a big problem when Mexican forces arrived. Colonel James Neal wrote to General Sam Houston pleading their case. But because Houston didn't think he could spare the men necessary for the defense, he refused the request. Instead, he sent Colonel James Bowie and a small force of about 30 men to remove the fort's artillery and then destroy the building. When Bowie arrived, he realized he didn't have the animals necessary to transport the artillery. He was quickly convinced the location held real strategic importance and decided to try and make the case directly to the Texas Provisional Government. Bowie argued that the fort needed more troops and more weapons if they were to withstand the siege, but it didn't work. The Provisional Government was in a state of complete disarray and couldn't muster any support. Even if Houston or the Texas Provisional Government had agreed to help, it's not clear it would have made any difference. Both Bowie and Travis had badly overestimated how long they had until Santa Ana's attack. Okay, so initially Colonel Travis is left to defend the fort. He writes to uh, General Houston, who is in charge of the Texas um, forces. And the general says he can't spare any men, but he does send uh, Bowie and James Bowie arrives with a small force, and Bowie's initial task was to take the armory, which is the cannons, etc., and to get them out of there so that the Spanish didn't, or the Mexicans didn't capture it. However, Bowie decides that he should help defend the actual Alamo itself. This leaves about 188 Texas volunteers, um, and as the video left off, it says that both Bowie and Travis completely underestimated how quickly Santa Ana would get to the fort. They thought they had more time. So Santa Ana arrives with a force of men, somewhere between 1,500 Mexican soldiers and up to 6,000 Mexican soldiers. The reports vary, but he arrives with a huge force of soldiers. They surround the fort, and for 13 days, there's a standoff. Now, for the Americans, they are <laughs> under-provisioned. They don't have enough bullets. They don't have enough weapons. They don't have enough cannon fire. And so they're having to hold off this Mexican army, and they do so for about 13 days. They do it valiantly. We're going to jump back into the video and look at a little bit of what they went through. Santa Ana's siege to take the Alamo began on the 23rd of February, 1836. Rumors of the army's imminent arrival had residents of nearby Bear fleeing. Travis didn't believe the reports, but nonetheless had a lookout placed on the San Fernando Church bell tower. Only a few hours later, scouts reported Mexican troops about a mile and a half outside the town. The Texans were still struggling to put together the manpower, weapons, and supplies they needed for an ongoing siege. They were far from ready when Santa Ana marched into San Antonio with an overwhelming force of approximately 1,500 troops. By comparison, the Alamo Mission defenders were only 188 strong. As if being greatly outnumbered wasn't bad enough, many of the Texan soldiers were merely volunteers who weren't properly trained as soldiers. Nonetheless, when Santa Ana raised the red flag that signified the defenders would be given no quarter, the defenders held their ground. Travis responded by firing a cannon back at the Mexicans. Bowie thought that provocation was a bad idea and sent an emissary to meet with Santa Ana. Travis, who resented Bowie's interference, sent his own emissary. Both emissaries were received by the Mexican troops and told that any surrender would have to be unconditional. Once this news was delivered to Bowie and Travis, they settled their differences and defiantly fired the cannon together. So the siege itself, once Santa Ana does do a full force assault on the Alamo, it only lasts a couple hours. The Texans fight bravely, um, but all 188 men in the fort die. Um, William Travis is one of the first shot and killed. Uh, he's standing up on the rampart, um, looking over the wall uh, when, he's, when he's shot by a soldier and dies. James Bowie dies in the sickbay. 
And then Davy Crockett is one of the handful of survivors who's executed afterwards. The Mexican army does allow about 14 women and children um, and a few free slaves, American slaves, to leave. That's where we get the story of the specific events. Susanna Dickinson is probably the most famous woman who's allowed to leave because she journaled about it. With her 15, she leaves with her 15-month-old uh, daughter. And then Remember the Alamo becomes the famous battle cry used by General Sam Houston when he defeats Santa Ana a few weeks later at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836. And this battle, San Jacinto, we talked about it yesterday, that is where Santa Ana gets captured. And in order to secure his own release from the Texans, because again, remember, he is both the Mexican lead general and their president, uh, in order to secure his own release, he basically gives up all of Texas and allows it to become an independent nation, which it will. And for about 10 years, Texas is his own country until it joins the U.S. in 1845. We're going to jump right back in the video, and then we'll finish with a little bit of the Alamo today. The defenders of the Alamo were ridiculously outnumbered and outpowered, but at least they had a tough, battle-hardened leader like Colonel James Bowie to help them through. Right? Well, no, not really. Bowie actually took ill on the second day of the siege and wasn't able to physically assist his men in the defense at all. Two doctors, including the fort surgeon, tried to diagnose him, but neither could determine what was wrong. The colonel was occasionally carried out to rally and encourage the troops, but historians believe it likely had the opposite effect. Seeing their leader and ostensible MVP so sick was probably more demoralizing to the mostly inexperienced squad than anything else. Finally, in the bleak remaining days of the Alamo, Bowie transferred his half of the leadership to Travis. Bowie would die with the rest of the defenders of the Alamo, but his family, who were at the fort with him, would live through the siege. The siege of the Alamo ended on March 6, 1836. It lasted 13 days, during which time all 188 defenders were killed. Only women and children were spared. Though the loss was pretty decisive, historians estimate the meager force managed to wound or kill roughly 600 Mexican soldiers. But more importantly, the encounter triggered a fighting spirit in the Texans that would become a battle cry for the revolution and ultimately lead to the state's independence. Today, the Alamo still stands right next to a shopping mall. Times have changed. So that leads us to the Alamo today. Uh, it's still a national story. It's a legendary story uh, in one of the most famous visited landmarks in the United States. This is inside the Alamo. Again, it's right in the city. It's, it's kind of bizarrely located right next to um, uh, a main shopping area in San Antonio. The grounds are beautiful. There's koi ponds. Remember the Alamo. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. That's just a quick little vignette story about probably the most famous battle in this whole era of Mexican-American War and Texas Revolutionary War. Uh, that's it for the day, 7th graders. As always, I appreciate you watching. Have a great rest of your day.